Happy Sabbath. I'm glad each and every one of you could be with us today. We are looking for a wonderful blessing that the Lord has for us in his word today. First, I want to encourage those, if you haven't already, uh, online giving, fredericktownsda.com slash giving. Or you could also do the mailing address, P.O. Box 348, Attention Treasurer, of course, at, and that is in Fredericktown, Ohio, 43019. Want to go into the praises and prayer request. We want to thank the Lord for watching over and guiding each and every one of us, especially those that have been dealing with the COVID 19. We want to update you with Maynard. Maynard is doing better. I guess he's at, at home now. He is enjoying things at home. They did not have to do any major thing. So I guess as, from as far as I know, his, his uh, heart did start to get back to rhythm, whatever all those particulars are. Uh, remember George, Andrea's co-worker that has a blood clot, our COVID-19 people that are, uh, that are dealing with that, including our first responders, giving thanks and praise to the Lord for allowing them the wisdom and knowledge to be able to help in every single case that they have. The tornado victims, I guess there were some tornadoes recently. Keep Craig and Melissa in prayer. Next week, this following week, coming up there to have a baby soon. We want to uh, keep Tyrone in your prayers, along with Beth. Both have cancer. We also have Tom and Maynard and others. Uh, Tyrone had COVID-19 and he was able to be healed from that. Continue to remember Lanny is having more pain in with his knee. Evelyn wasn't feeling well today. She's feeling a little better, but she asked for prayers. And I also want to ask for prayers for the Kajiado that's in Kenya where I just got back from. The school and the rescue center there. I want to praise the Lord that we were able to get things accomplished, get the boys' dorms finished, part of the restrooms. But the wonderful blessing on top of that was 47 baptisms and 16 confirmed with studies and more baptisms to come. So praise the Lord for that. Today we're going to study and continue looking at the bridegroom in Matthew chapter 25. Now each and every one of us have read this time and time again. So a lot of this is going to be, uh, we're going to be going over it again, but hopefully the Lord's going to bring some more insight into us. We can parallel and put some things together and help us to understand that it is very important that we have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, before I begin, let us have a word of prayer. Dear, gracious, loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for all of these people that you've kept them safe. We've got many others that are sick and ill, and we pray that you would watch over them, each and every one of them. But most importantly, I pray, dear Heavenly Father, for the eternal salvation. That is what this is all about. That's what we're here on earth for. And I pray, dear Heavenly Father, that you would be with each and every one of us mightily. I pray, dear Heavenly Father, that as I begin the, the sermon of your words, that you would help me to speak your words, that you would help to keep my mind clear and focused, and that everything that I say would be acceptable in your eyes. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Again, like I'd mentioned, we're going to go into Matthew chapter 25. And first, we're going to read chapters 1 through 13. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened unto ten virgins, who took their lamps and went out to meet the, broom, the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise, and five were foolish. 
those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. <clears throat> but the wise took oil in their vessels and their lamps. But while the bridegroom delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight, a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom comes, go out and meet him. Then all the virgins arose and trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should not be enough for us and you, but go rather to those who sell and buy for yourself. Verse 10, while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. Afterwards, the virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open. Open to us. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is to come. As I'd mentioned, we're going to look in parallel with the Scripture, with some of the spirit of prophecy to help us to give more information of what the Lord has for us and how we can truly understand this parable. As we begin, let us remember that in many parts of the East, the wedding feasts were held in the evening. The bridegroom goes forth to meet the bride to bring him or to bring her to his home. By torchlight, the bridal party proceeds from her father's house to his own. There is a feast provided for the invited guests in the scene upon which Christ looks a company are waiting to appear, waiting the appearance of the bridal party, intending to join the procession. Lingering near the bride's house are ten young women robed in white. Each carries a light, lighted lamp and some flagon of oil. All are anxiously waiting for the appearance of the bridegroom. But there is a delay. Hour after hour passes, the watchers become weary and fall asleep. At a midnight cry is heard, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet the, him. The sleepers suddenly awake and spring to their feet. They see the procession moving on, bright with torches and glad music, they hear the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride. The ten maidens seize their lamps and begin trimming them in haste to go forth. But five neglected to fill their flasks with oil. They did not appreciate, anticipate a long, such a long delay and they had not prepared for this emergency. Now, with all due respect, each and every one of us know, and the Lord has told us, because he loves us, the different things that, may, that will happen in the end of time. Now, I'm not here to predict which day, which time. We know only the Father knows that. But we have been given through Scripture different statements to give us an idea of where we are at in earth's history. If we look at verse 2, a couple interesting notes. We look at, at verse 2, it says, Now five of them were wise and five were foolish. If we look at the Greek word coming from uh, the number 5429, which means intelligent, thoughtful, discreet, and implying a cautious characteristic. 
if we look at the word foolish, coming from the Greek word 3474, they're impious, godless, lacking in respect or reverence. So we know each and every one of these women, uh, we know that they are all Christians. They all do have a relationship with Christ. What are they doing with that relationship is what we're looking. Of course, we know that as they talk about in verse 3, that the foolish ones took their lamps and took no oil. Of course, we know from the scripture, the lamp, the Greek word coming from 2985 is a torch or a light. We remember seeing in verse 12, the master of the feast declared, I know you not. Those are some serious words and words that each and every one of us, none of us want to hear. We all should hope and pray for those words, well done, good and faithful servant. Let us look at the scripture for a couple of texts of the lamp. Of course, the one that each and every one of us know the most is Psalms 119. So if we turn to Psalms 119 and 119, 105. Psalms 119, 105. Each and every one of us are familiar with this. And the scripture says, Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The word of God is a lamp. Let us look at Proverbs chapter 6, verse 23. Proverbs Chapter 6, verse 23. In the heading, we are talking about the different, um, the different things that the Lord is telling us. It tells us Proverbs 6, verse 23, the commandment is a lamp and the law is a light. He goes further on saying, reproof for instruction are the way of life. So the commandments and the law are a lamp and light. By the lamps, it's represented, as we saw from the word of God, they're represented as God's word. The oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Each and every one of us are aware of that through our scripture reading. Christ's object lesson tells us, so from the holy ones that stand in God's presence, his spirit is imparted to a human instrumentalities who are consecrated to his service. The mission of two anointed one is to communicate to God's people that heavenly grace, which alone can make his word a light lamp unto our feet and a light unto the path. In the parable, all the 10 virgins went out to meet the bridegroom. All the lamps and the, all had lamps and vessels for oil. For a time there was seen no difference between them. So with the church that lives just before Christ's second coming. All have the knowledge of scripture. All have heard the message of Christ's near approaching and confidently expect his appearing. But as in the parable, and so is now, a time of waiting intervenes. Faith is tried. 
And when the cry is heard, behold, the bridegroom cometh, ye go out to meet him. Many are unready. They have no oil in their vessels with their lamps. They are destitute of the Holy Spirit. You hear those words, they are destitute of the Holy Spirit. She goes further on saying, without the Holy Spirit of God, a knowledge of his word is of no avail. The theory of truth unaccompanied by the Holy Spirit cannot quicken the soul or sanctify the heart. One may be familiar with the commandments and the promises of the Bible, but unless the Spirit of God sets the truth home, the character will not be transformed. Without the enlightenment of the Holy Spirit, men will not be able to distinguish truth from error, and they will fall under the masterful temptations of Satan. We must be very careful, brothers and sisters. We need to study the scripture daily. We need to be about the Father's business. He will take care of those that are about his business. I had the opportunity to go to Kenya, and while we were there, being about the Father's business, he protected us. We didn't have any trouble with this corona that's going around. We were blessed over abundantly, as I'd mentioned. We had 47 baptisms. Praise the Lord. And I praise the Lord for each and every individual that heard that still small voice. And they went ahead and did what the Heavenly Father had asked them to do, as each and every one of us should do. There's a reason why it's called a still small voice. We must listen intently. And when we hear that, we must Act upon it. The class represented by the foolish virgins are not hypocrites. They have a regard of the truth. They have not, they have advocated the truth and are attracted to those who believe the truth, but they have not yielded themselves to the Holy Spirit's working. They have not fallen upon the rock. Jesus Christ, and permitted their old nature to be broken up. This class are represented also by the stony ground hearers in another parable that we have read before. They receive the word with readiness, but they fail of assimilating its principles. God has given us the scriptures, and we are to take each and every principle and to apply it to our own lives and our own time. Its influence is not abiding. The Spirit works upon a man's heart according to his desire and consent, implanting in him a new nature. But the class represented by the foolish virgins have been content with superficial work. They do not know God. They have not studied his character. They have not yielded communion with him. Therefore, they do not know how to trust, how to look, or even how to live. Their service to God degenerates into a form. They come unto these people. It comes and sits before thee as my people. They hear my words, but they do not do them. For their mouth shows me much love, but their heart goes after their covetousness. That comes from Ezekiel 33, verse 31. In the signs of time, we're told, the solemn fate of the five foolish virgins presented in the parable of the ten virgin is recorded to warn those who, while professing the faith of Christ, have become cold and backslidden. The five foolish virgins represent the careless, the indolent, the self-satisfying professors of religion. 
They have a claim, expectation of entering heaven sometime. Yet they have no purif- they have not purified their souls by obeying the truth. They understand the theory of truth, but they have no vital connection with God. They have no vital connection. They trust to feeling. They neglect the search of the scripture. They are satisfied to walk in the sparks of their own kindlings. We are all exhorted to be diligent that we may make our calling and elect sure. But I am greatly troubled, fearing, yes, knowing that there are many who profess the truth who are not testing their lives and the character of by God's great moral standard of righteousness. We're to take this scripture and it's to help us to examine our own lives. Now, each and every one of us, we, as I've mentioned before, we all need to go to the Lord one-on-one with the Lord. Ask him, as David did, create in me a pure and clean heart, a right spirit, but to show me anything that is unclean or anything that I have done wrong. And with our abilities, the best we can with the Lord, we're to go out and do and make the wrongs right, if possible. Let us turn to Second Timothy. We'll go to Second Timothy chapter 3. And each and every one of us have read this multitude of number of times talking about the last days. Second Timothy chapter three, verses one through five states this now also that in the last days, perilous times shall come. Now let us look at that word perilous, hard times, dangerous times. Some of us may think that things are hard right now. We haven't really seen hard yet. We've had some things taken away from us, but realistically, as we've been talking before, we're blind, wretched, naked, poor, and we don't even understand that. Some of the things that we expected or thought should be a normal Some of those things, we don't have those choices now. We're seeing even in the stores where we don't have that same variety of options anymore. We're very fortunate as Americans, as I've mentioned before. You go to other countries, sometimes they only have one or two options. Nowadays in America or before, you had multiple options of whatever you were looking for. We hope that it'll come back, but if it doesn't, That's quite all right. The Lord is there. He has always been there. He tells us, let us not forget in the way that the Lord has led us in his past history. He is there. He has always been there through the little, through the big things, and even through the harder times that are to come. But if we don't have that relationship now, and we can't trust in him in the little things, then how can we trust in him with the big things. We must trust in him. We need his food more. We need God's word more than our own necessary food. Now, how much do each and every one of us as Americans desire food? We need it to survive. We need water to survive. But with that, we need God's word more then we need the food and the water. We have to we have to get that. We have to process that in our brain. Sometimes our feeling says, well, no, the scripture is not true. That's not the way I feel. Even though those feelings are different, if you check them with the scripture and are wrong, we need to throw those feelings off to the side. It's a thus saith the Lord. And I say this respectfully because we do not know the time. Today is the day of eternal salvation, the scripture tells us. The Apostle Paul points out that there will be a special characteristic of those who live just before Christ's 
coming. In the last day, perilous times will come that men shall be lovers of their own selves, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God and having the form. Let us go back to 2 Timothy 3, where I'm sorry I had got ahead of my sec, myself. And uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, and we'll go through each and every one of these that the Lord tells us. Second Timothy chapter 3. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful. Each and every one of us have seen each and every one of these characteristics already. Unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, continually see all of this through the chaos in the world. Traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the form of godliness, but denying its power from such turn away. When startled from their lethargy, they discern that the destitute and entreat others to supply their lack. But in spiritual things, no man can make up another man's deficiency. We have to get that and learn that from and by ourselves. The message of the gospel has been heralded. Let him that a thirst come. And let who, him, whoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. But the character is not transferable. No man can believe for another. No man can receive the spirit for another. No man can even impart another the character, which is the fruit of the spirit's working. Each and every one of us can do a self-examination on where our characters are. In a very difficult crisis, how do we react? That can pretty much, that helps me sometimes when I get in a stressful situation. The, when I stop and think of how I just instantly reacted, the Lord brings to my mind whether I need to throw the line tighter, whether I need to put some, where I need. He, he's perfecting each and every one of us for heaven. And there are these little things that he helps us to see where we fault and where we need to give more to him. Now, I don't claim to be sinless. Actually, I feel like a lot of times that I'm worse than Paul. But each and every one of us we have all sinned. We all fall short of the glory of God. But the wonderful thing is we have a loving Savior that is right there, that he tells us if we ask for his forgiveness, he is faithful and just to forgive us of all of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. <clears throat> the saddest words that ever fell on mortal eyes are those words of doom. I knew you not. We can't afford to hear those words. It's not an option. Let us look over at Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13, starting in verse 24 talking, my heading says, the narrow way. Starting in verse 24, these are Jesus' words, written in red. Strive to enter through the narrow gate, for many, I say to you, will seek to enter and will not be able. When a master of the house was risen up and shut the door, he began to stand outside and knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open for us. And he will answer and say, I do not know you where you come from. 
And then, then you will begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence and you taught in our streets. But he will say, I tell you, I do not know you where you are for, from. Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. We must be very careful. We must search daily. We must look deeper and deeper in God's word and then correct our own characters according to God's character. It is the darkest, it is the darkness of misapprehension of God that is enshrouding the world. The last rays of merciful light, the last message of mercy to be given to the world is a revelation of the character of God's love. The children of God are manifested his, to manifest his glory in their own life and character and are to reveal that the grace of God has done to them. The light of the Son of Righteousness is to shine forth in good works, in words of truth and deeds of holiness. Thus in the night of spiritual darkness, God's glory is to shine forth through his church in lifting up the brow, the bow down and comforting those that mourn. All around us we hear the wails of the world's sorrow. In every hand there are needy and distressed. It is ours to aid in relieving and softening life's hardships and misery. Practical work will have far more an effect than mere sermonizing. We are to give food to the hungry, clothe the naked, shelter the homeless. We are to call we are called to do more than this. The wants of the soul, only the love of Christ can satisfy. If Christ is abiding in us, our heart will be full of divine sympathy. The sealed fountains of earnestness, Christ-like love will be unsealed. God calls not only for our gifts for the needy, but for our cheerful countenance why we are doing that, our hopeful words, our kindly hand clasps. When Christ healed the sick, he laid his hands upon them, so should we in close touch with those in whom we seek to benefit. Now, of course, we need to be careful in this time as right now with COVID-19, we must be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. We may not need to touch them immediately right now, but we can touch them spiritually. There'll come a time once this virus is over that we can go ahead and possibly touch each other again. Speak to them words of cheer. Pray for them. There are those who need the bread of life and read from the word of God upon many is a sick soul in which no earthly balm can reach nor physician heal. Pray for those souls, bring them to Jesus, tell them that there is a balm in Gilead and a physician there. Ministry of Healing tells us Christ's method was that he met them as someone that need that desired their best for them. He met them at their needs, and then after that, then he bade them to follow me. He didn't go in and start preaching a sermon right off the bat or start telling other people, you're not doing this, the Bible says this or that. He went in and mingled with them. And we need to do that too. People do not care about how much we know about the scripture unless we show them how much we care about them as an individual.
It is the love of God continually transferred to men that enables him to impart the light. If all were willing to receive, all would be filled with the Holy Spirit. It is a privilege of every soul to be a living channel through which God can communicate to the world the treasure of his grace, the unsearchable riches of Christ. There is nothing that Christ desires so much as agents who will represent the world, his spirit, and character. There is nothing in the world that the world needs as much as a manifestation through humanity of the Savior's love. All heaven is waiting for channels through which can be poured the holy oil to be a joy and a blessing to human hearts. And one last statement. From Christ Object Lessons, page 69. Christ is waiting and longing desire for the manifestation of his self in his church. When the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come to claim them as his own. It is a privilege for every Christian not only to look, but to hasten the coming, soon coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. As before, I would ask each and every one of you to search the scripture and search your heart. Jesus loves you very, very much. And he desires that you be in the kingdom. And he desires more than anything you to live a life and a life more abundant. But most importantly, he desires to tell you, well done, good and faithful servant. So we must be diligent in doing it now. Tomorrow may be too late. Let us have a word of prayer. Dear gracious, loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for your words of wisdom. We thank you for your parables. Now we ask that you would help us to Uh, digest this, to meditate upon it so that we can take the principles and put them into our own lives. That we may go out and spread this love and joy of Christ to others. Now is a very good time where a lot of people are in despair or a lot of people don't have hope. So this is a great opportunity. So help us, dear Lord, impress in our minds who to talk to, who to call, Help us, dear Heavenly Father. But most importantly, we pray that this would help us to realize that no matter where we are in our relationship with you, we must draw closer and nearer in a deeper dependency upon you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.